Hi, this is your Sabdul Bharti and we are here at KubeCon in CloudRadioCon in Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we have with us John Eckright, Principal Customer Success Engineer at Racken. John, it's good to have you on the show. Hey, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Since we are here at the show, I would like to hear from you that you have been, you know, talking to folks. What kind of discussions are you hearing here? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been it's been really interesting talking to all all the different people on the floor and 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 going to all the different talks. Uh, one of one of the first things that you know the f trends that I've noticed is just kind of how welcoming the community is. Uh, I I think the last KubeCon I went to is in 2018, so I've kind of been you know, doing other things in my career path for the past few years and been kind of out of it for a while. Uh, so I kind of felt like an outsider coming in, but after talking to so many people and, and with everyone being so welcoming, you know, I'm, I'm going home not, not feeling that way. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I've really noticed is that there's, there's a lot of really awesome solutions to some really hard problems and, it's it's really cool talking to all the different people about it, you know all of the really unique challenges that they're experiencing and the and the creative ways that they've come up with to solve those problems. Uh, and probably the final thing that I would say is that it seems like every conversation I have starts with, okay, so you've got an OpenShift cluster, you've got a Kubernetes cluster, now we can do X, Y, or Z. And you know, as as I said, like you know, not a beginner, but as someone who's kind of coming back into it, my question is, you know, okay, but how do we get that cluster? Where do we, how do we deploy that cluster? Where do we run that cluster? And, you know, how do we, how, how do we get to that point where we have the Kubernetes cluster? So, um, you know, mo most of my customers are at the point of, okay, we want that cool thing. But how do we deploy OpenShift? Can you talk about since you have mentioned OpenShift, and I would also like to understand, you know, how is OpenShift doing on bare metal? Yeah, actually, one of the, one of the things that we've been doing, we've been working with uh, Red Hat to enable OpenShift deployment on bare metal with our product, uh, Digital Rebar, uh, which essentially automates the whole lifecycle of hardware. And so we're able to deploy to, you know, any size cluster our, our, the OpenShift software. Um, and we've, we've worked with some really great people at, at Red Hat to kind of come up with, we came up with a POC and now we're working on a reference architecture that we can share with customers and have to, to kind of provide a, you know, a, a document that we can point to to say this is, this is what we think is the best or the right way to deploy OpenShift on on bare metal. As you're working with Red Hat to deploy, you know, OpenShift on bare metal, what are the lessons that were learned there? You know, one of the one of the first things that we we learned, uh, we came up with our POC and then kind of started shopping it around to our customers. We work with, you know, Fortune 50 customers and in, in the financial industry. Uh, and most of those customers want to keep everything in house. They want to run everything on prem. They want to run it on their own hardware. And so we came up with this one way to do it, and we're shopping it around. And most of our customers were like, "That's great, but that doesn't really work with our existing processes and procedures. You've kind of, you know, drawn outside the lines. And due to regulations and things like that, we we probably can't implement this." So we started working with a couple of different customers to, you know, draw up more specific requirements. Like I said, that's kind of where this reference architecture concept came from is, okay, we have these regulations and these kind of things. And while I, as the developer, maybe envisioned it this one way, uh, learning how it's going to be implemented in the real world in a practical sense uh, really kind of changed our approach. And so I feel like, not that we wasted any time, we learned a lot along the way, but had we maybe engaged with our customers a little earlier and gotten that information on, you know, how do we, how do you, how will you actually run this in the real world? I think we maybe could have gotten, gotten a, maybe a jump start, let's say. Um, and then the, you know, the other thing is that, you know, Kubernetes is hard. Um, 
I have, I have, a, I have, a, I've gained a, a whole new respect for the people who are who are running and operating Kubernetes in the real world today, um, because it's it's not easy. And and while it does help enable, you know, complex solutions to complex problems, um, it it in itself is also a, a very complex platform. Um, and so uh, the 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 logs are just so important um, and. <laughs> Learning that early on really helped our our development and our troubleshooting process. Yeah, as your co-founder and CEO often says that this complexity is not going to go away. We have to learn to deal with it. And companies like Rack and they actually try to help uh, customers, users deal with this complexity. Now, uh, in general, when you do get the whole you know complexity you know of Kubernetes, uh, can you talk about because? Rack and you know bare metal, you know more or less like. So, how do you rack and roll in this whole Kubernetes ecosystem? Yeah, I mean we're we're enabling customers and users to deploy, uh, you know, really big clusters, uh, hundreds and thousands of bare metal machines running Kubernetes across across the world, actually. Um, and so, it, you know, we're we're kind of the guys that you know give you the platform to go and do all the cool stuff. We're we're kind of the behind the scenes support, if you will, you know. But um, it, it, you know, you, you it's called digital rebar because rebar is what you know strengthens concrete, right? And so we we're kind of that underlying uh, you know strengthening the word I'm looking but yeah we're we're the we're you that underlying the Kubernetes concrete yeah we're the yeah exactly we're the we're the rebar in the Kubernetes concrete exactly yeah in this whole cloud cloud radio space nobody talks about bare metal you know so once again here what kind of discussions were you hearing about it where people are saying these are the advantages these are disadvantages these are pros these are cons of bare metal in this space yeah, I mean, price is the big one. Uh, it, there was a recent Gartner report that they put out that said their statistic was it takes something like seven months of AWS to pay for a server. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of variables involved in that, and that's kind of an average. But, uh, you know, when, when you've spent seven months and now you own this hardware, that's a much different proposition than we're, we're paying this bill every month in perpetuity. Uh, now, granted, uh, once you own the hardware, you own the hardware, right? So when something breaks, you have to go and fix that versus if it's in AWS, you know, you, you just go redeploy or, or maybe you have to open a ticket, but, you know, you just redeploy and then that hardware problem has gone. When you're running your own data centers, you know, you've got to manage and run and make sure that your hardware is, is up to spec and, and isn't broken and throwing alarms. Um, I do also think that once you have control of that hardware, it, it makes it easier to trace out, okay, we've got a failure in this pod. Is that actually a code failure? Is that a Kubernetes failure? Or is that a, a hardware failure somewhere in that stack, right? Did we have a disk fail or a, a NIC fail or something like that? So. And also there was a lot of, you know, discussion, you know, DHS, you know, he wrote about, hey, we have left the cloud. And a lot of folks, you know, depending on, when we look at things like edge computing, you know, this yep. is all, you know, devices running. So what kind of also trend you are seeing back towards decentralized or towards, you know, hardware and metal? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. We're, we're seeing a lot of customers because they want that super low latency, especially for AI workloads. They wanna they wanna have super low latency, so they're running a lot of workloads, especially inferencing, just on the edge because it gets it that much closer to the customer and reduces those seconds matter, you know. Um, and so I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more decentralized architecture where more and more is getting pushed to the edge. Uh, there there's actually been a, a few good talks around the the conference about edge computing. Um, and, you know, I feel like it was a big trend a couple of years ago and kind of went away. But as as these machine learning and these AI workloads really start to roll out across the world, I think it's going to be 
the catalyst that really pushes things to the edge faster. Is Reckon helping any customers who are dealing with uh, AI, Gen AI, LLM workloads? We have a number of customers that are doing Gen AI, Gen AI and see, I messed up. <laughs> we have a number of customers that are doing Gen AI and machine learning workloads. And that's, that's exactly what they're starting to see is that we, you know, we have great big data centers and great big machines, but we want to reduce that latency and push, push as much as we can to the edge so it's closer to our customer so it has the biggest impact. Um, and then only calling home to do those really big workloads. While we are here, so of course, in this ecosystem or open source, a lot of innovation is happening. You know, a lot of, I mean, every six months or three months, new things come up. I hope there, will, there won't be anything as big as Kubernetes again. We have to relearn everything. But we kind of tend to assume that everybody is on these modern technologies, but there are a lot of companies who are still on legacy systems, traditional systems, and they are thinking of, not thinking about, they have the whole strategy, but sometimes this complexity, uh, cost, intimidate them, you know, they slow them. Is Reckon also working on bringing those companies to, so that they can start leveraging these modern technologies without having to deal with challenge, complexity, you know, and all the, you know, it's, it is intimidating at times. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I think one of the coolest things about our product is that I, I think we have something like 50 years collectively or 60 years collectively bare metal experience within our company. And that's essentially been codified in our product. And that's what you get when you buy our product. I mean, you get the automation and everything, but what you're really getting is our, our decades of knowledge in how to not necessarily reduce complexity because that's not always possible, but at least manage the complexity in a sane way that doesn't make you want to pull your hair out and run out of the room screaming. You know, we, we, we realize that these hard problems aren't going anywhere. And the key is figuring out how to deal with the hard problems in a, in a sane and reasonable way. Reckon talks a lot about infrastructure as code. Yeah. You know, uh, what kind of discussions you're seeing here in uh, platform engineering is a big topic here either way. So what kind of discussions you're seeing around these two topics? <laughs> so I think, I think there, I think platform engineering gets confused with platform infrastructure engineering, uh, because platform engineering seems to be that conversation I was referring to earlier that starts, okay, now we have the Kubernetes cluster, we can go do these things. But platform infrastructure engineering answers the question of how do we get that Kubernetes cluster in place in the first place? Um, and there, there are there. I'm going to a talk here in just a second uh, talking about bare metal, but there, there really isn't a lot of conversation about that. Um, I feel like a lot of people are running in the various different clouds, whether it's Amazon or whatever, um, which. That, I mean, that's great for for some companies, but again, when when dealing with these financial companies, they don't want to run anything in the cloud. They want to, you know, it comes down to data sovereignty, right? Like they want to keep all of that. They want to control all of that. So a lot of it's even in like air gap data centers where, you know, you're not really getting data in and out except for a few specific ways, right? So um, it's... I think it's a interesting conversation that's not really being had a lot yet. Uh, but th like I said, there it's definitely ramping up versus previous years. I think the in technology, there's a pendulum that swings one way and swings the other. And we went from on-prem to cloud, and now we're starting to swing back the other way to on-prem, especially with, as we were talking about, the edge things where you know, maybe it's not a traditional data center in what we thought of as a data center 10 years ago. Maybe it's a, you know, back room in someone's office where you're running, a, a, you know, a cluster of Raspberry Pis to run your Kubernetes cluster or whatever. But, uh, the, you know, the, the landscape is changing, but the, the more things change, the more they stay the same.
Right. And, and then also the way our geopolitical political situation also changing, of course, sovereignty is becoming very, very critical place, especially after the U.S. elections, you know, a lot of the war going on, plus emergence of new workload where things are moving closer and closer to users. Uh, edge is the way. So do you think as, you know, that just there will be more push for once again, bare metal. People want cloud native like experience. But they want it. They want all the advantages. But they also want the the flexibility and benefit that bare metal offers. So they and I think bare metal, in a way, offers the best of both worlds. You can have cloud native experience, and that's the beauty of whole open source. You can run everything on your own data center and edge devices. There are even tiny Kubernetes deployment distros that you can run at the edge of small devices. So what kind of trends you're seeing from that? You did touch upon that briefly, but where you're seeing this is something concrete which is happening. Well, I mean, I, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head with, um, you know, bare, bare metal is kind of the best of both worlds, and and you're right, people want that cloud-like experience on bare metal, which is something I think we help provide to the customer. Um, as far as concrete, I mean, you know, again, like I say, where we have we have one customer in particular that is that is moving as much as they can to the edge as as rapidly as they can. Uh, and they're able to do so with our software because it enables them to provision remotely at these sites, you know, and, and they have hundreds of sites. So it's not just, oh, we, we can't just roll a truck to go provision all these sites, right? We need some kind of tooling that enables us to provision and manage these things remotely from a, a centralized location, even though you know, we have we have sites spread across the United States. John, thank you so much for joining me today. And of course, talk about Rack and the whole bare metal, uh, how where things are heading. And you're right, you know, like pendulum, like fashion, you know, we keep going back and forth. So we will once again start talking about that. Thanks for great insights. And I would love to have you folks back on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.